Uh, thank you much, uh, Joel. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I, I view uh, my assignment today as as uh, as broadening our view and taking it from uh, individual farms up to a, a more global perspective with uh, the the goal of of placing this webcast series uh, really in a in, in a global context. Uh, in that regard, I, I think it's uh, it's probably appropriate that we start by reminding ourselves of the, of the primary challenge before all of agriculture. And that, uh, I think you could easily say, is to increase food production by 50 to 70 percent by 2050. And there are some estimates that it would indicate that the challenge may be even, even greater than that. Uh, we have a couple of options that are widely recognized in, in accomplishing that, uh, that goal. Uh, one is to increase the harvested area. Uh, the challenge there, the problem there, is that often moves us into uh, into uh, a land that is much less suited to production and is more vulnerable and, and more uh, uh, more likely to contribute to, to environmental issues than land current under production. So most people would would look to increasing productivity or increasing yield on the lands we currently farm and where we, we take uh, this, this corn field that's pictured here and we move from the treatment on the left side over to the treatment on, on, the, on the right side. And it, it is pretty clear to us that, that uh, uh, supplying adequate phosphorus to crops is, a, is a, of course an essential component in that, that yield increasing process. And here you see uh, pictures from various uh, cropping systems around the world where you can see the impact of, of insufficient phosphorus uh, and, and clearly see how important adequate P is in crop production. Well, I, I suspect uh, we, we all pretty much already knew that, but it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves when when we're attempting to address some pretty wicked manure management issues that, that the phosphorus in that manure, as, as uh, Joe already pointed out, does have great value. And if we can, if, if of course we can get it to the right place, and that is a big part of our challenge, and that's the challenge we have pretty much all over, all over the world. Now let's uh, uh, focus our attention uh, for a couple minutes on, on phosphorus use in, in the U.S. Uh, the bar graph you see here uh, compares the, the quantity of phosphorus removed by crop harvest, that's the, the black bar, uh, to the P applied to fields as manure, that's the, the gray bar that's stacked up on top of the other one, or as commercial fertilizer, that's the tan bar. Uh, now, back in 2007, uh, where this data is focused, uh, removal accounted for uh, just a little less than 90% of the, of the phosphorus supply. Uh, now, we, we just released estimates uh, for the 2010 year. We don't have those, those uh, in this slide, but they show that at a national level today, uh, or at least in 2010, uh, removal was about equal to the sum of manure and fertilizer piece. So now that black bar is essentially the same height as the sum of the, of the manure bar and that fertilizer bar. Uh, a few additional points uh, to note from the numbers that are depicted here. First, uh, removal exceeded phosphorus use, fertilizer use, by 1.2 million tons. And so that compares the gray bar to to um, uh, the black bar, and what that means is at a national level, there is indeed an agronomic need for manure pea, even with the full complement of fertilizer pea that is used today. Secondly, uh, the field applied manure pea is equivalent to about a third of the phosphorus removed in harvested crops. That means simply that it's a significant amount. Uh, the, you know, the, the challenge is, as uh, that county map that Joe showed uh, indicated, much of it is not produced where the feed is grown. And so that, that decoupling creates regions of surplus and regions of deficits. And then finally, uh, phosphorus removal by crops is increasing today three times faster than manure pea production. 
And as we look to the future, to me, that signals that demand for and value of manure pea uh, should indeed grow. Well, at, at this time, I, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, take us back and, and, and look at a very short history of uh, history lesson on, on phosphorus fertilizer before we actually get into looking at, at phosphorus resources. I think this is, this is important to understand uh, what we're talking about relative to those resources and, and, and reserves. Uh, early sources of pea fertilizers were actually primarily animal-based. They were derived from, from bones and, and guano or, or seabird, seabird uh, uh, droppings. And by the beginning of the, about the 19th century, the value of calcium phosphates in those bones was recognized. And, and uh, in places like England, the demand for bones as a fertilizer material really began to, to rapidly grow. And there was a lot of scavenging, actually, of, of bones for their phosphate content. Uh, the treatment of bones with acid uh, to improve solubility began uh, sometime in the early to mid-1800s. And uh, a little later, uh, the production of superphosphate fertilizers began in, in uh, Suffolk, England, by treating bone uh, and, and apatite, which is the mineral form found in, the, in phosphate rock, with sulfuric acid. And essentially, we had the birth of the commercial phosphate fertilizer industry at, at that point. Uh, today, phosphate uh, rock is the major raw material used in the, in the production of, of practically all phosphate fertilizers. And so now let's take a look, a little deeper look at, um, at, at phosphate rock. And uh, we'll, we have to first to point out that there are really two kinds of deposits, sedimentary versus igneous. Uh, the sedimentary ones are, are clearly dominant with, with uh, over 80% of phosphate, phosphate rock used in fertilizer being of, uh, of sedimentary and so they, they uh, sedimentary type, so they, they appear like you see in the slide here in the, in the column off to the right. Uh, sedimentary phosphate rocks were, were formed in, in uh, an ancient uh, continental shelf uh, marine environments, uh, basically by the upwelling of deep, cold seawater uh, that was high in, that's high in dissolved pea, and then it's mixing with the warmer water up on the, up on the shelf that is sunlit, and, uh, and it, causing a situation where you have supersaturation with respect to calcium phosphate materials, and so they precipitate out. Uh, it's an environment where we also see uh, uh, marine life uh, flourishing, things like algae, shellfish, vertebrates of various sorts, uh, and, and eventually then you get a, a thick deposit of uh, phosphate uh, rock formed, uh, from either the, the direct application, of, uh, direct precipitation of, of appetite, uh, and by the, the, then the deposition of the skeletons and debris from that uh, marine life we mentioned. Now, igneous phosphate rock deposits uh, are the result of, of direct volcanic activity, and depending on their origin, can uh, can vary all over the board in physical and chemical characteristics. But often, they tend to have lower reactivity than the sedimentary uh, phosphate rocks, which are, are really, uh, really dominant uh, across the world. Now, this map uh, uh, is a map of, of global phosphorus resources. Uh, the green dots are sedimentary deposits, the ones we were just talking about, and the blue squares are, are igneous uh, deposits. You can see that uh, phosphate rock deposits are scattered throughout uh, most of the world, but uh, of course, they vary a great deal in size. Uh, Morocco there in, in North Africa has the largest phosphate reserves in the world, uh, followed by China, and we'll, we'll get more into, uh, into that in, in the size of reserves just, just a little bit later. We, but before we, we go any further, we, we need to define a, a couple of terms that often cause confusion when we're discussing phosphate supplies. Uh, the terms are reserves and resources. Uh, reserves are phosphate rock that can be economically produced at the time of the determination. 
uh, with existing technology. So they're sitting there basically ready to go if uh, someone decides to mine them. Uh, resources, on the other hand, are the rocks uh, of any grade, including the reserves, uh, that may be produced at some time in the future if market conditions are appropriate and if the technology exists to, uh, to extract the phosphorus uh, rock uh, from, from the deposits. Now, the system appears rather straightforward, but the estimates are, are really plagued with a great deal of uncertainty, and I want to spend a little time on that because of the controversy that's been associated with this issue over the last year or two. To illustrate, uh, I, I once again want to look into our history a bit, and we'll, we'll go back initially to 1971, and the Institute of Ecology, or IEE, uh, when they published uh, several articles that drew attention to phosphate rock reserves, uh, and estimating depletion is sometime in the next 90 to 130 years. Well, uh, that's really, uh, when you consider that this is a, a, a nutrient that can't be replaced by any other kind of, uh, of material, uh, that got a lot of attention. And it, can, it caused significant work in this area in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Uh, USGS was very involved. The United States, what was at the time, the United States Bureau of Mines got heavily engaged in, in efforts during, during this time. But then in 1995, uh, Congress dismantled the Bureau of Mines, and the USGS inherited the responsibility for making and reporting estimates, but they did so with very limited budget. Since then, the, the detailed, the publicly available information concerning phosphate rock reserves and, and resources has, has really been rather, rather limited, and of course an information void ended up forming. Well then along uh, came uh, 2008 and in the concept of peak phosphorus, the sequel to peak oil, uh, which used uh, current USGS data current at the time and a modeling routine uh, developed originally for oil resources by Hubert. Uh, to predict when phosphate rock production would peak. This approach predicted peak phosphate rock uh, production by around 2030 and the depletion of global peak reserves in just 50 to 100 years. Well, of course, this stirred things up in several circles. And for the next few years, we, we were seeing many articles on global phosphor supplies in, in very well-read publications like Scientific American and Nature and, and several others. Uh, one of the most recent references to peak phosphorus was actually just a couple weeks ago in a highly viewed uh, TED lecture that some of you actually might have, uh, might have already, already seen. Well, uh, the, the peak phosphorus con uh, controversy caused the International Fertilizer Development Center, IFDC, uh, to conduct uh, an in-depth literature review on past and current phosphate rock estimates. Uh, it, along the way, reviewed methods for estimating world reserves and resources and eventually then made what they called the preliminary updated estimate of world phosphate rock reserves and and resources. And here you see the result of that IFDC study along with some updated USGS estimates. Um, the blue bars in this graphic are USGS estimates and the orange bars are the, the IFDC estimates from the new study. Uh, it's interesting to note that before the IFD study, uh, USGS was, was estimating reserves at 16 billion tons. That's the first blue bar in the graph. The IFDC estimate ended up being nearly four times higher at 60 billion tons. Well, the following year, USGS revised their estimate up to 65 billion tons. So in one year, one year, rock phosphate reserves increased fourfold. That illustrates the dynamic nature of these global estimates and also also, of course, the uncertainties that estimating them involves.
Now, the last two bars in the graph uh, show estimates of rock phosphate resources. And remember, this is the larger quantity. Uh, the first one from the IFD study at 290 billion, and the second one, the blue one, from the USGS with a, a higher number uh, uh, exceeding 300 billion tons. So a lot of change. And, and this, uh, this graphic really takes a longer term look at, uh, at phosphate, phosphate rock reserve estimates. Uh, you can see how the lines are varying depending on, on the country. Uh, in about 2003, the government of China uh, provided data to USGS for the first time. And you see for several years afterward, uh, China appeared to have the largest reserves in the world. But then uh, around 2009 to uh, 2010, those figures were, re were revised downward. Uh, as you look at the lines, the other uh, big change was in the estimated size of the of the North African, or the uh, in the slide it's labeled Morocco and Western Sahara reserves, uh, which are now uh, the, the largest known reserves in the world. That's the green line in the in the graph. So really, the the bottom line here, if you will, is that reserve estimates are dynamic. They do vary uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, so here, the, we're, we're just looking at the, the latest estimates uh, for the world's top 10 phosphate rock reserve holders. And again, you see Morocco and Western Sahara accounting for about three-fourths of those reserves. Uh, uh, China is in second place at 6% and down about halfway through the table. You'll see the U.S. coming in at about, uh, at about 6%. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, reserves are not uniformly distributed around the world in any sense of the word. The other side of the phosphate rock uh, coin, we've been talking about reserves and resources. The other side of the coin is production, which is shown here for several countries uh, and, the, and the world total in, in red. Um, uh, you can see that uh, during this period, Russia, that's the, the black line, uh, and uh, U.S. production, that's the blue line, have, have declined. Uh, Morocco, the yellow line, this is the country with the very large reserves, has been slowly increasing. And the, the, you know, the greatest change has, has occurred with China, the green line, uh, where you see that for the last 10 years, uh, uh, it's just been skyrocketing. And now is by far, uh, the rep China represents the largest uh, producer of phosphate rock in, in the world. So to, to kind of summarize uh, this section of our webcast today, uh, first, uh, worldwide there appears to be ample phosphate rock for the foreseeable future. That's not something to lose a lot of sleep over. Uh, based on USGS 2012 production, uh, and reserve estimates, we're looking at over 300 years of production. If we go out to resource estimates, that number indicates over 1,400 years of production. And if you look at a, a document that I hadn't mentioned, I haven't mentioned yet, uh, that was produced by the Global Partnership on Nutrient Management called Our Nutrient World, they indicate that we will run out of oil, gas, and zinc actually before we run out of uh, the reserves of, of phosphorus. Secondly, uh, phosphate rock reserves are indeed unevenly distributed globally, uh, with Morocco holding, as I indicated, about three-fourths of the reserves, China 6%, and the U.S. Uh, uh, down at 2%. Uh, those U.S. reserves uh, are estimated at about 40 to 50 times annual current phosphate rock production. And so as we look to the future, uh, we will become more and more dependent on imported phosphate. That all said, uh, phosphate rock is a non-renewable resource and does deserve our best stewardship efforts uh, uh, for the long-term needs uh, of humanity. And finally, uh, need for and value of phosphorus recycled from manure should indeed increase. And that value will be based on both agronomic need and on a need to avoid negative environmental impo impacts at the, at the point of production. So uh, with that, 
I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dana Kirk with Michigan State University who will really delve into technologies that can help us realize uh, that value that we're, uh, that we're talking about here.